Okay, hi everyone, this is SmithyQ, SmithyQ.com, and I'm back here with another um, video lesson. This one is going to expand on something that I mentioned almost in passing in a, in a previous video, I think it was my last one, in which I mentioned how I won a game by virtually never retreating any of my pieces. I never made a move backwards. And this is actually um, one of the most important things when it comes to chess, when it comes to chess strategy, when it comes to chess thinking. And, well, we're going to explore this idea here. If we look at, you know, the original position, we just look at some pieces here. And one of the most important things in chess, right, the concept of space, is that we can divide the board in half. It's white has his half, black has his half. And in order to advance, to make progress, we need to start controlling that half of the board. How do you do that? Well, we got to move our pieces forward, right? So we can see, you know, we did a normal move, you know, if the knight were to go to f3, well, now it's controlling two squares in the black camp. And we'll see the more we move the knight forward, if the knight were on e4, it'd be controlling four. If it's on d5, it's still controlling four, but they're deeper into the black position. And then finally, if we were to get a knight to the sixth rank, it's actually controlling six squares, and this is the most amount of squares a knight can control. Uh, the more, you know, even though... I might advance the knight here. It's still only controlling six squares. But the idea is still the same. The more we advance the knight, the more we advance our pieces, the more squares we control. The more our opponent's territory comes under our control. Similarly, if you look at the bishop, right? In the initial position, it controls two squares in the black camp. If we were to go if we were to develop, now it controls five. It controls six. Move into the middle. It still controls six. But again, it's getting deeper into the black territory. And so we can see, again, by moving our pieces forward, we're able to control more territory, which is going to allow us to make progress. Right? And then the rook is a special exception. Just because we can see here in the original position, um, the rook controls seven squares, seven up and seven to the right. If we move the rook into the center, it's still controlling um, seven squares in each direction, 14 total, right? 14 total squares here, 14 total squares there. So the rook is actually kind of strange in that centralizing the rook doesn't do anything. Not really. The rook will always control the same amount of squares. What stops the rook or what limits the rook are other pieces. So if we were to move a piece here, we can see instantly the rook loses some effectiveness. There's a piece here the rook is losing effectiveness. So this is why rooks, we always say rooks need open files, because if there's things in the way of the rook, it can't use its full potential. However, if things are wide open, then the rook can control up to 14 squares. And again, you imagine that we get the rook here into the seventh rank, say, we got, it is controlling by itself already seven squares, which is more than the knight or the bishop can control anywhere else. And in fact, controls the most. The only piece that can control more, of course, is the queen. So this gives us, right here, a general idea for, for strategy, or what we should be aiming to do. If you don't know what to do, right, you have no obvious plan, well, we try and move our pieces forward. We want to see if we can control more spaces. Um, in particular, the knights to move forward, we get a knight in the sixth rank, that's amazing. Move the bishop forward, it controls more space. And we want to get a rook on an open file, and if possible, you know, an open file into the opponent's position. And it's actually amazing how just these um, few ideas, these, this concept, um, can really guide your play. And there's also, of course, the inverse, is we don't want our pieces to retreat. If our pieces are forced backwards, so, you know, if we look, you know, this knight's amazing, but if it's forced to retreat, you know, back to g3, say, well, now it's only controlling two squares. Or if it's forced to you know, go back to d2, it's not controlling any of the black position. And so what we want to do is we want to be able to move our pieces forward and not retreat. And conversely, we want to see if we can force our opponent's pieces to retreat, to go backwards. Because if we can force our opponent to go backwards, almost always, that's a good thing. Now, I've got a couple of games that are really going to highlight this. I'm not going to analyze them deeply, but if we just want to watch the flow of the pieces, and we're going to see how I, um, or the winner, is constantly moving forward 
and driving the opponent back. So this first example, I am white, my opponent is rated about 1500, I was rated 1950 at the time. And by the way, I know there's a huge rating discrepancy and you know, black plays some funny moves. However, this is how, in general, a higher rated player outplays a lower rated player. Is it necessarily fancy tactics? When you look at this game that we're about to see, there aren't tactics, really. Um, it's simply white moves forward and black is forced to concede ground. That's it. So if you look at this, um, so black plays a funny move, and we can see instantly he's forced to retreat. His bishop is uh, going back. And then this is actually a kind of a funny move, actually. I thought I was winning the bishop. Here, I thought he was forced to play knight c6. I'd play bishop b5. I'm going to win at least a pawn, maybe more. I thought I was just winning instantly, five moves. And I, I missed that he could play c6. <laughs> so, um, that's kind of funny. But anyway, uh, we develop, develop. I move my queen back. So, because I miscalculated, I was forced to retreat. But this is really the only retreat I make in this entire game. Exchange, exchange. We can see instantly, this is a bad move from black, right? Why? Because look, my knight goes from d2. Now it's on e4. Before it was controlling nothing. Now it's controlling two squares in the black position. And black doesn't appreciate this. Um, he overlooks this check. Boom. Boom. And here we go. And now you're going to say, okay, Smithy, why are you showing us this game? Uh, black is... His position is, dis is in disarray, he can't castle, his king is weak, he's got a horrible pawn structure, his pieces aren't developed, uh, white is perfect, what's the deal? And it it's true. We don't want us to distract us from the overall lesson. Because if we see, from now on, white never retreats, his pieces consistently go forward, they take over the black position. Because even though I'm up a pawn in this position, the game isn't winning. It's not over. There's lots of room to make mistakes. But we'll see that just by applying this simple concept, just moving the pieces forward, um, white's play is very easy. So we develop a piece. He plays g6. He wants to be able to move his king to g7 to get his rook out. But that lets my bishop go as far forward as it can. And it's now controlling into the heart of black's position. I play knight e5. And again, the knight is now dominating four important squares. He retreats. He doesn't want to lose his bishop. I castle. Knight d5. Queen e2. Just move my queen over towards the central file. Queen c7. Rook. Going on to the most open file. It's semi-open. Knight d7. Um, and then here, I simply exchange pieces. Take. Take. Queen comes in, I'm threatening mate. Take, take. And look what's happened. In effect, by trading black's most active pieces, he is now left with simply a knight. This bishop is terrible. This rook is obviously <laughs> the worst piece on the board. This rook isn't doing anything. And all I need to do now is just keep improving my pieces. I'm going to play c4. His knight will be forced to retreat. My bishop will probably move here, where it's lancing down this diagonal. We got an open D file. It's fully open. My rooks are going to get there first. And that's simply it. That's going to be the whole game from here on in. There's no plan. There's no long-term strategy. I'm honestly thinking essentially one move at a time, but it's just improve my pieces. And look how effective this is. Okay, he attacks my pawn, so I defend it. Um, he randomly retreats his knight. That makes me happy. My rook goes open file. He gets his uh, bishop out of dodge. Bishop on the best diagonal it can be. His knight comes, I instantly force it back. Now the rook comes in, and we can see now the rook is dominating, it's going inside his position, it's pressuring his pawns. I've now got complete control of the file. And then we can see every one of my pieces is better than every one of his. And it's just by slowly moving my pieces forward. He's moved back. This bishop has shuffled back and forth several times. This knight has gone back and forth several times. Black has been unable to control any part of my territory. Well, I've steadily increased. It's at the point now, it's not even clear what black can do in this position. And I'm able to win just a few moves. Um, this is actually uh, kind of a pretty finish. Check, check, and mate. And we can see... 
starting all the way back from here. I move forward, he moves back. I move forward, I move forward, I move forward. We got all these arrows moving forward. He, he retreats. Again, that's an unforced move. That's so common. Is um, The unforced retreat is a mistake. Now he's thinking maybe he wants to get the knight to f5, right? He's thinking maybe he wants to play this, get the bishop over here. Again, it's not just you know a random move. Again, if he can get the, the knight here, say, maybe he can kick away the bishop. I, he's not just doing it randomly. He's got ideas. However, if your idea involves moving your pieces backwards first, we have to be so careful because so often it's just a mistake. And we can see he's moving back. He's forced to move back. And I'm always moving forward. This idea is so powerful. If you don't know what to do, move your pieces forward. Improve your pieces. Or conversely, push him back. We'll look at another example. So this game perhaps highlights it even better. Um, I was rated almost 1800 at the time. This was played just about two years ago. My opponent was 1550. And so I'll just go through this quickly. And we're able to reach... Um, my favorite um, setup. The idea here is that it's the Maricosi bind. I, of course, control this square. I control this square. And those are the two main pawn breaks Black likes to get. He wants to play d5 or he wants to play a6 and b5. And he's unable to um, if white plays correctly. And so we just develop. Developing normally. And I think perhaps the best thing to do with um, in my... This type of setup... White often does the exact same thing. His knights go here, his bishops go here, he's going to castle, his queen will go here, his rook goes on the open files, or on the c file, on the d file, and you can do that against just about anything black does. It's sort of like the, uh, the Sicilian version of the London system in the open Sicilian, the Maricosi bind. Anyway, bishop to castle, castle, queen d2. Now, Black, he does a good thing here, because he's suffering from a lack of space. We can see that I control um, the, my fourth by four ranks. He's stuck on the third rank, and he decides to trade pieces. That makes sense. Take, take. But then he plays this ugly move. E5. And we can see how this square is now phenomenally weak. If I can get a knight in there, um, this is just, you know, the classic textbook weak D5 square. And the problem is, is that I'm ready to jump in essentially immediately, and it's very hard for him to get the normal um, Sicilian counterplay. He's simply worse here. And this is why this hole is so important. It's because I can put my piece here, and he can never chase it away, not with a pawn. And we know we want to move our pieces forward. This is why, this is why such squares are so important, because it's an anchor. It's a spot where your opponent can never make you retreat. And if you can never retreat, it's almost always you're never worse. That's because that's what it is. Chess is played with pieces. If your piece you know, can't be neutralized, you're at the very least equal, if not better. Now my opponent, not knowing what to do, he played queen c7, which simply walks into, well, rook c1. He tries to block it, but doesn't matter. I jump into the, uh, I jump in. He doesn't want to take, take, take. Uh, my rook's on open file. I'm just going to absolutely dominate. It, like, look, like, look how all my pieces are ready to flow in here onto the queen side. I'm going to double rooks. Queen comes over. The bishop can jump into this square. My pawns will move forward. He's stuck behind this pawn. He's in trouble. So instead, he moves his queen back, queen d8, which is a mistake. And we can kind of see that, right? Because he's moving backwards. Whenever your opponent moves backwards, it's almost always a good thing. And what am I thinking? I'm thinking, how can I go forwards? Bishop b6. Now my bishop is forcing him back. Rook d8. Then I take his bishop, which kind of seems funny at first. But then we see this. And we can just see the huge pressure on the d-file. This pawn is going to fall. Um, he can't bring a rook over because my bishop controls it. We see the importance of controlling space in the enemy's territory, it's stopping him from, well, stopping a simple threat. I'm simply attacking this pawn. What can he do? He tries to find a move. He plays knight e8, but that's a retreating move. He's moving backwards. He's controlling less space. 
And so this is where the second idea is really coming in, is that whenever you see a retreating move from your opponent, tactics are very often possible. And I find a tactic. There's not too many candidate moves, actually. It's c5. Just adding another piece into the attack, really. I guess it's a pawn. Um, there's nothing else he can do to defend. Um, he can't push forward, because I'd simply take with the e-pawn. But if he takes, take... Well, he's losing the exchange. And so instantly, I've got a winning uh, advantage now. I'm up material. But then, again, the accuracy of being able to finish this game off. Because so often, we get a good position, but then things go awry. Right? The opponent gets counterplay. And so what do we do? We keep hammering home. Um, we move our pieces as far forward as we can. We control as much space as we can. And we try and push our opponent back. And um, if I do say so myself, I played this part very well. I check him. His king is now going to be further away in the coming endgame. I improve my bishop. My bishop comes to d5. If he takes, take. Oh, there's that pin again on the c file. He's just going to lose his bishop. So he can't take. He brings his rook over. Take, take. And now look, now he's got a weak pawn. I move my queen in take. And we can see how the rooks start flooding into his position. He's, he gets up a pawn. And now again, I'm trying to um, get into his position. I'm able to play b4 using the pin. And then this pawn just marches all the way to the finish line. There's a nice tactic to finish it off. Take, take, make a new queen. And if we were to look through this, if we were to just zoom all the way to the back, let's see if I can figure out how to do that. If you just look at my pieces, right? it, um, again, we're just watching the flow. This is the only time I move backwards. When he attacks me with a pawn, giving up his huge positional weakness. Then after this, my pieces, they just constantly move forward. And that tells you, in general, who is doing better in a given position. If one side is always going forward, they're probably doing better. If one side is going forward and the other side's retreating... That you probably know one side is very close to winning. And again, no grand strategy, no thinking a thousand moves ahead. It's just pushing my pieces as far forward as I can while also trying to limit what your opponent can do. And that's really it. Now, I've been showing two positional games, but it's equally um, possible, this idea is equally valid in more tactical situations. I got two games from the 1800s that really illustrate this. So this game was played um, from William Davies Evans against Alexander McDonnell back in 1826. Um, this is the Evans that created the Evans Gambit, um, which we're seeing here. And the advantage of the Gambit, of course, is that we get open lines, huge development. And here, Evans played knight g5. Now, his opponent played knight d8. Which we can instantly see, it's a retreat, it's going backwards, yes, it's protecting f7, but that tells us something is suspect. It probably tells us that's not the best move. And experience has shown that knight h6 is better. Now at first thought you might be thinking, oh, but the knight is on the edge of the board, and it's not as good. Yeah, that's true. However, it's better than moving this knight that is developed all the way back, because now both knights are on the back rank. And this gives us an idea that maybe we can see some tactics, right? Or how can we go forward? And so let's look what happens. We open the position up. Now bishop a3. Now the bishop is slicing down that diagonal. Even if this knight does develop, he, um, he won't be able to castle. We'll see that he actually plays knight h6 anyway. So this knight retreat was for naught. f3. Okay, bishop moves. We can see, oh... He's forced to retreat. Rook slides to the open file. He's forced to retreat. And we can see that black was getting pushed back, and white's doing very, very well. And then black, uh, sorry, white, he starts thinking, maybe there's some tactics here. Because my pieces are good, his are bad. He plays rook takes d8, queen takes d8, now he's cashing on f7. If black were to recapture, say bishop takes f7, bishop takes, knight takes... Well, then after queen e6, that's just mate. 
sorry, uh, for completeness, takes, takes, again, the bishop. Um, so that's the main. Sorry. Anyway, so he doesn't take. He ends up playing queen h4, and this allows a really uh, pretty finish. We move forward, move forward, move forward, move forward, and that's made. And do we see what happened? Again, now was this ta was this uh, attack completely sound? It was the 1800s? Of course, there was mistakes and accuracies. But look at the general flow. Look what happened. We had this knight move back that enabled White to improve his position. Look at this, f3, so that way he was able to now move his rook over. You can't do that now because the bishop controls the square. Right? Now is f3 a weakening move? Well, yes it is, it does allow this check, but it doesn't really matter, does it? Because if you look at what happens, he's, okay, his bishop is forced to retreat and his queen is forced to retreat. The rook is on a huge file. This tells us that this position must be better for White. And White then, he cashes in, with a really pretty final position. Fantastic, right? And again, it's the ideas, even in a tactical situation, we want to move our pieces forward, we want to um, push our opponents back. Very rarely do we want to retreat. And in fact, a hallmark of some of the great attackers is that they just don't retreat. They keep moving forward. And this last example will um, hopefully drive that home. So this last game, it's again the Evans Gambit because Evans Gambit is one of my uh, favorites when I was a kid. And this is played between George Perigol and William Popert in 1830. I don't know anything about these two players, but it's a pretty game. So we can see, again, White's got a dream position here. Everything is fine. He's got the open center. And our goal as White is to try and move our pieces forward as much as we can. So we develop, boom. And this includes our pawns. Now our pawn jumps in, he takes, that's fine, we play bishop a3. We could have recaptured, but then black's going to exchange queens. He plays knight a5, he's attacking our bishop. But look, his knight is moving to the edge of the board. Do we just retreat the bishop somewhere? No, the hallmark of the great attacker is that we try and move forward as much as we can. We improve all of our pieces. Uh, Perigol played rook e1. Now, again, he can't castle because of the bishop, and the rook is eyeing on the king already. And then after take, queen comes up. Um, it's not actually a peace sacrifice, but he is down two pawns so far. Bishop b6. So our queen's attacked. Where should it go? Hopefully, at this point, you're starting to realize that our first instinct shouldn't necessarily be how can, where should I move my queen, but rather, how can I go forward? And is there a move that moves forward, right, that keeps the pressure on, that improves our pieces, and that hopefully doesn't lose the queen as well? And there is. Rook takes e5. Now there's a pin. The queen is immune. This rook, now this other rook can slide over. Almost every piece is into the game. Things are looking good. Queen d7. And so now here, white, he digs in. He knows that he's operating at near maximum efficiency. Right now he's playing with all of his pieces except for one rook. Black is playing without both rooks. And his king is in the center. So white could sacrifice a rook and effectively material is still equal. Right? Because um, if you've got all my pieces developed, um, he's got his pieces developed, neither side would be playing with rooks. This is what happens. Rook takes. Doesn't want to take with the queen because then the rook would slide over, winning it. Knight e5. Queen's forced to retreat. Rook slides in. And just look at white's position. He's forced black back and he's always moved forward. White has not made a single retreat in this game, even costing material. Black tries to move forward, which makes sense. But then, unfortunately, after take, take, queen b5, he's in absolute peril. King d8, knight f7. And one last move forward seals it. That's actually mate. 
Holy cow, wasn't that pretty? And that started all the way back here. Right? A very tactile game. He moves forward. Moves forward. Look, improving his pieces, right? He doesn't think about defending his piece right away. Take, doesn't matter. He uses tactics to justify it. Do we move the queen? No, we go forward. Right? We're even willing to sacrifice. To look at this, our entire army is in... Um, it's fully active. It's ready to go. White has so many threats in this position. Black doesn't know what to do. He tries to improve his piece. That makes perfect sense, right? However, after this exchange, White still has all of his pieces doing exceptional. Well, pretty much all of Black's pieces are still terrible. And his king is no safer. And that's a pretty picture. So again, this idea... Um, it's kind of revolutionized my chess. It's something I've been thinking about off and on, you know, for, for a while, but it's really crystallized. Um, um, Grandmaster Igor Smirnov, he helped. Uh, GM Yasser Sarawan. Um, there's a couple of others. Um, but if you watch Grandmaster, especially Grandmasters against amateurs, this is what they do. They move forward, and eventually their opponents, they through inaccuracies, they're forced to retreat, they end up moving backwards. And then the positions become overwhelming like this. Or they become overwhelming positionally, like the two games I showed earlier. And so this is why it's so important. We don't retreat. You know, never retreat, never surrender. That's that's how it works with chess. Our pieces move forward, we seize territory, and we do our absolute best not to give it up. So hope that helped. Um, there's other examples will be coming as well. And this is just something to pay attention to. Whenever you watch a game, especially if it's a strong player versus a weaker player, whether that's Grandmaster Amateur or, you know, 1800 versus 1500, you know, even, you know, 1200 versus an 800, is that by and large, the better player is moving forward and forcing their opponent back. So, hope that helps. Questions, comments? Um, anything you want me to expand on, let me know. I'll see what I can do. Um... Love feedback, positive or negative, and uh, that's that. So SmithyQ, smithyq.com. Uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Bye for now.